Hello cellists. Here we are in week 11 of the lockdown and we are going to start this week with a refreshed view having had our technicals week last week. Uh, we're coming back to looking at a piece of repertoire and a study and there'll be the old technical digest as well. Um, first uh, let's say what the piece is. It's actually it's not going to be a piece in its entirety it's going to be a, the central movement of the Brahms E minor sonata. So that is the minuet and a trio in that sonata. Now obviously this is going to be quite controversial to offer um, the lessons on the cello part only in this week because obviously a sonata is actually for two equal voices. In fact historically those of you will know if you uh, have uh, done a bit of research in your music history um, for example, in the Beethoven cello sonatas, the first early two sonatas are really for the piano with the cello accompaniment. Um, and as we know through history and time, you know, a cello sonata or a violin sonata, we do tend to have a focus on that string player being uh, the point of interest. But in actual fact, absolutely, it's a level playing field and both parts are extremely important. So as I say, it's going to be quite um, a challenge to be looking only at the cello part but we're going to try and consider how it fits in the score with the pianist and that my presentation of performance at the end of the week will be with one of my working pianists uh, providing me with um, the piano part in the way in which we normally work together. Okay. Without further ado, let's see what the other things are going to look at. So we are also going to look at another Foyard study. And this one's going to be number 34. Now, this is going to really cover two areas of technique. One is going to be strength of the left hand in double stopped chords. Um, and then that's the initial approach. But then it's actually going to move to bow techniques and in a way it was really thinking about building on the very last technicals lesson where we just touched a tiny little bit on the types of spiccato and how you might do sautier and um, I really feel that a little bit more on that would be useful um, to, to discover and find a context in which it makes a bit more sense. Um, so that's why we're picking it. it in relationship to the Brahms the Brahms is full of short notes and how short are they and how shall we be playing them? How do we solve this problem? So in a way there is the tie between the shortness of notes, what, how things are written and what that means and how we're going to translate that into a bowing. Um, so there is some relationship between the two about short notes with the bow. <laughs> now for your technical warm-ups I think that today Monday, we shall be looking at um, A minor in sixths, which means that we're actually looking at the key of the, minu the minuet um, that Brahms has written there. And we are also thinking of the sixths that we're looking at, or the different double stops in the study, and some element of understanding within the Brahms, because the Brahms is full of an awful lot of um, implied chords you know, spread across, you know. <laughs> So some of these uh, shapes within a bar uh, are, are just broken chords and so I think there's a direct relevance. So without further ado, the sixth A minor, I was thinking in terms of the harmonic, so it would be like this in terms of separate bows for each sixth. <laughs> and just have a little look. It's extremely straightforward and we're looking at it and once we move to the A string in little groups of pairs there's two semitone, display semitone shapes there and there's a stretch tone one to two B to a G sharp and then your second finger will need to knit back to the C natural plus the third in the A. Little top tip at the top there. Now that's your underlying um, structure of, of the left hand but I would like you to consider doing something with the bow because this is really going to be about bowing and bow control and articulation this week 
And so I might propose that we look at an element of how we may uh, employ this bowing in the bronze. So we have a slur with a lift and then two up bows short. And again. Now be careful. It isn't a slur sitting on the string. It won't be. Which are both long. It's not that. So let me try that slightly quicker so you can hear the difference. the second note was long and actually as soon as you've arrived at the second note I'd like you to lift it and you can come back down again of course as well so that's one idea so we're looking at a slur with straight into a lift so you're straight away going to have a short note on the second note and the following the third and fourth notes will equal the shortness of the second. That's short. So we've only got one that's the full length and it goes straight into a short note. So that is uh, one type of bowing. Um, you can take the very same bowing but do the sixth the other way around. So we do it down, start on the higher note. have a freeze frame. So here we are. The top line is showing you the six as they are. I didn't put any fingering on but it might help your mind to understand. The first pair um, start with the fourth finger on the A and the second on the C in order to be close by and the rest of it follows all the way up the A and D string. The first variation as you can see is starting on the lower note da and you notice the little tiny staccato mark underneath the slur on the second note. And the final variation is just the other way around. And this is being about <coughs> training your ear and therefore the control of the bow so that we are for sure lifting rather than So as soon as you've arrived, you come off. Okay, this has got a direct relevance to your bronze uh, with one potential bow solution. But it's really understanding what you hear and we may have a different solution, but we want it to sound like that. Right, moving on, we'll look at four yard number 34. Now this study is written in sort of like this shape. Etc. Um, when you first are playing it though, you really need to know that your left hand is solid and secure and understands uh, what those harmonic shapes are for each pair and so that we can also understand where the shifts need to be quick This will also be further understood when we change the different bow patterns and we'll be looking at mm, two or three different bow patterns and Moving away from on the string to slightly off the string to really flying off the string You know, we'll look at all those types of solution so the initial thing it would be definitely to play this <laughs> comfortable with the finality of that C, put an E on the bottom of it. So there I was just literally playing each crotchet beat um, with the notes that are presented on the page but rather than becomes so you can just play each of those twice. I mean you could I think in terms of uh, getting flow you could easily decide to just play them only once 
that when we come to the interesting bit. <laughs> So that you can really, if you play that where there's, oh, we're playing half the number of those, we're not doubling them, um, your left hand truly understands what the pattern is. And you, in doing the double stopping, you have no choice but to take the whole hand back. Um, let me just see if I can show you what I mean by that. Um, here, whole hand goes back. So let's just see that again. The whole hand goes back. It wouldn't be trying to contort yourself to sort of squish to where, you know, try leaving one finger behind. The whole hand as a unit must travel back. And I think by doing it in a double stopping fashion, you will do that so that later on, if you were playing it really quickly, you know, you could actually travel through quickly because your left hand would know where it's going and your bow can just be rushing off and doing whatever it wants to do. So that's uh, my challenge for you. The whole study, so unlike uh, weeks one to nine, where we just took a quarter of more or less of the study each uh, lesson, I, I'm saying do the whole thing as a double stop. And then we will look at different bow solutions and patterns and which part of the arm and hand we'll be using and how to really engage your ear in the shortness of the note, which isn't always the arrival or the end, it, it can be a combination. And we need to be aware of both, as I mentioned on Friday, the beginning, middle and end of our notes with regard to articulation. Speaking of which, we're moving on to Brahms. Of course, there is a piano part missing and the piano part would be giving you, which is what the cellist actually has in their part a bit later on. Um, and we therefore must be sure we're going to be matching the length of note and the articulation with your pianist. Um, and understanding what the keys on the piano are able to do in terms of shortness of note. We can also just look at the score. So when we have this upbeat, crotchet, it will not be as short as a, uh, which is, has a staccato note on it, mark, staccato mark. It won't be as short as a quaver with a staccato mark is a shorter note in sound than a crotchet. With a staccato mark. Now obviously we could get really picky and every context is different but you need to have a true awareness and even if you make a conscious decision that you want your crotchet to be equally short, um, there's your decision. For me I'd say that that's too short, a bit poked and that we want a slight a longer length with a lift, not which is a bit too much of a downward attack and a tiny amount of hair and I think you can have the beginning attack with a tiny bit longer bow. This will be helped by flat bow hair. Or... Now you may or may not have detected what I was doing with the bow stroke there. So the last bar I've just played is absolutely in line with what we've been looking at in the warm-up study or the warm-up technique of the um, and a little bit of, of what I talked about for the study. So that we have a slur to a staccato. So you need to lift as soon as you've arrived. But we are actually going into it smooth. If you look at the writing, he has specifically put a slur onto the staccato. Um, it isn't, it's not to sound like a crotchet, a gap, and then a staccato note. You slur into it and lift off. So the arrival is smooth and it's the fact that you lift off that turns it into the staccato crotchet. So you need to be really aware of your bow control to make sure that that is absolutely what you hear. Now, if we go to the first full bar for the cellist, you know, he's actually marked the same bowing there. I didn't play that. Oh, when I first demonstrated, I did a down, then separate bows. Now, let's first look at what's printed. So what's printed? A slur to a staccato, but this time into a staccato quaver, which will be shorter than the following bar. Um, and then two more staccato quavers. Now, if you were to follow exactly that bowing, the, the separate quavers will be two ups. So we have down 
goes um is slightly over accented that but the idea is so you can hear we've arrived slurring into the beat and lift off i've lifted off and then the following two notes two up bows so we know the sound shape that is being commanded of us here um, and the control for that can be quite a challenge all the time. Every which way, if you're always doing down to a lift and two ups, you can do it and absolutely, definitely try this work exactly as it's been written. Um, but you could be aware that you could equally decide that you would like to have a little bit more control, but recreate the same sound shape. So the idea would be that if you were to separate those quavers, you still want to make sure that you have that slur sound into the B. Sounds like and you need to get that to sound the same. And then it would be absolutely permissible to do a slightly more controlled version. So let's just see the two types. The first is as written. I forgot the two ups, okay? And now we're trying to make it sound the same, but we have a little bit more control with more separation of directions of bow. part of the exit there. You may have noticed that as I rose up to the top, I did three ups. So there's another choice, but all the time you need to be aware of your oral, the oral architecture and how you're going to solve it, what the composer's intentions are and what's happening in the score at that point. Now at that point for that rise, that um, the piano part is still falling yada da fa yada da fa so they keep having this falling quaver to a crotchet where the crotchet has staccato on it so they have the, the fall with a lifted note now in that respect you need to also understand that these bars are like little pieces of a jigsaw puzzle so in our opening bar you have yada da so you have the first three quavers in the piano Yada dum. Let's just see if I can find to play those myself. So we've got Yada dum. Yada da 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 dum. So if we understand the full jigsaw puzzle, even though we haven't got a pianist playing, we can understand by looking at the score why it's important to get clean articulation so that everything feels like it fits together perfectly like this. Um, so that's what I want you to be really mindful of. Do not play mindlessly. And obviously you need to be very, very careful about your timing, especially if you're practicing this without your pianist, um, because it's too easy to perhaps shorten note, you know, and just be gabbling away. <laughs> okay. So we have just come to um, an end point towards we're starting to wind down on this phrase. Now these crotchet notes, remember they are longer than the quavers. Now that's a wonderful moment to be really allow yourself to sit down on the string there with the, with the little legato slur. And we want to remember things like rotation of the left hand, or the left arm rather, so you get good weight on the C string here. You don't need an awful lot of bow, and that way you can get a good speech on there. And that's really absolutely implying a diminuendo as we taper away at the end of that phrase. Let me just check if there's anything particularly important. Um, Pampiaram. Yeah, there's a little suspension of uh, going on in the piano part. Um, tiaram, tiaram, tiaram. Um, so 
when you do put the whole thing together, you realise it's absolutely like a breath and a sigh and a catch in your breath as you fall to the bottom of the phrase. And then we have some three beats rest in the piano with the, the cellist taking the opening line. And that's quite nice, two little ups. Because it gives a, a lovely little playful light upbeat kind of quality to it as we lean on the slur down. Now in this following line, you are definitely accompanying a company line and you need to take all these considerations about note length into consideration. You need to think about those. Lift. So we have a slur of three. Those are smooth. And as you go into the third note, you lift. Now that's partly the reason I've given you the... It's about having real careful thinking to your articulation. So you really are playing what you see and it will make all the difference. Um, of course, at this point, the piano has a beautiful melody. And we've got yada-da-da-da. So it's again, it's the jigsaw puzzle. Um, the, the fitting of the glove. We have uh, an extra quaver than the piano part had at the opening. They had the... where we have got... Beautiful, falling to the bottom with care and grace. Watch out, the bottom note, staccato crotchet. It's not a quaver, it's not. Be careful that you wouldn't catch it too quick, too short. So you can have it in time, but too short. Uh, let me see if I can demonstrate that, which we don't want. You can hear why it's not particularly pleasant. It feels like a kind of a full stop, or like this. Um, so be sure that it is a lifted crotchet. Now at this point, it rises out more, rather than just being the hub up underneath, we, we rise in pitch and it really fits absolutely with the, the, the peak point of the piano melody. The piano has the like we had previously um, and we are definitely an interlocking part with that. So I think you can come up more for that. With regard to the stroke, string crossing at that point, Fairly flat bow hair, so you can get the control of the articulation again. Lift. Lift. Now, we'll look at the end in a moment. So just sort of checking that on the way up, we've got down, up, up, down. Now all of these need to be pretty much matched in terms of length and lift. Obviously the first one could, could have a slightly different length to it or a little bit more of a lean. Or not. You make the decision. Um, as it's a first beat it potentially could have a little bit more of something to it. Maybe vibrato. <laughs> point where we we're just coming towards the end of what we're going to look at today. Um, the little repetitive fragment here. Do not try to get back to the heel in that. It's really effective just to allow yourself to come along the bow stroke and then by nature as you come away from the weighted end of the bow you will have a very beautiful natural disappearing away like what's going to happen next, kind of a question mark. Um, let's just, just try that if I weren't to travel along the bow. I think it's more boring. Even if I bring in a little bit of shaping. But if I travel, you know, in there, I've just managed to get a different kind of sound. Whew, slightly more wispy. I'm wondering where it's going, perhaps a bit more magical. That may not always be what you fancy playing, and I must admit, I, I'm never quite sure what I might play. Uh, and that's half of our delight, of course, uh, even in working and looking at something that you might know very well. It's, it can still present something new. So that's our, our first little foray um, in the Brahms 
the new edge movement uh, and it's it's quite um, playful remember that remember that it's playful uh, so we've covered the more or less half of this part of, um, of, the, of the movement of the minuet um, and we will obviously be covering the rest of the minuet and the trio in the next three sessions so enjoy your explorations as ever and I shall see you tomorrow